Welcome through the open door. Jim Hannock here with co-host Mario Ramos Reyes. Today we're going to be talking about the Christians in Need Foundation. Its mission, a very special mission, is to preserve ancient Christian traditions so that they may continue to inform the communities to which they belong, especially in the Middle East and Caucasus. Its focus is the Armenians in the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh that lies within Azerbaijan. The foundation an uh, interesting auxiliary also fosters ethical analysis for young people here in the United States. It understands that without the capacity for ethical reasoning, we won't be able to understand the challenges that our fellow Christians face internationally. Our special guest is Rita Madesian. She is a member of the Foundation's Board of Directors. Madassian has a, a background in legal practice and business. She holds an LLB from the University of Reading, Berkshire, UK, and an MA in business law from the City of London University. She works closely with uh, Christians in Need Foundation co-founder, Siobhan Nash Marshall, who has twice been a guest here on The Open Door, and she works closely as well with Stephanie Havens, the Chief Executive Officer for the Foundation, and Stephanie, too, has been a guest here on The Open Door. Let's begin, as we always do, in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's let's mm -hmm. just add to that. Let's just add to that, uh, remembering a, a patron of, of Armenia, uh, St. Gregory the Illuminator. Yes. St. Gregory the Illuminator, pray for us. Amen. Well, Rita, Rita, if we may, could you first just tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, there you are in Glendale, and you are an advocate for Christian communities in Armenia. Could you connect a few dots for us? Sure, Jim. Uh, thank you, for Jim, for inviting me to your program. You're very uh, And thank you for doing this uh, every week and giving a voice to the voiceless. Now, um, I'm a third generation diasporan Armenian, which means that my grandparents survived the Armenian genocide when a million and a half Christians were killed in what is called today uh, Turkey. So um, I grew up in the Middle East and eventually ended up in California. Just as a background, the origins of the Armenian church date back to the first centuries. The founders of the Armenian church were the apostles Thaddeus and Bartholomew, whose graves can be found in Armenia and are honored as holy shrines. At this period, Christianity was an underground religion, and uh, Armenians used to be Zoroastrians until they converted. 
the official conversion of Armenia to Christianity was realized in 301 AD by St. Gregory the Illuminator, whom you just mentioned, who is the patron saint of the Armenians. Thus, Armenia is the first day to adopt Christianity. I remember when I was growing up in the Middle East, uh, there used to be a huge poster in our classroom, a picture of an Armenian church, and it said, uh, Armenia, first Christian nation. And our teacher always used to point this out to us and say, see that? That's who we are. Always remember that. So we used to feel proud. We got it right. We were the first ones. <laughs> so uh, ever since... Uh, adopting Christianity for the past 1700 years, Armenia has been continuously under attack. It's a kind of, uh, it's in their DNA. Uh, they built up a resiliency to die for your faith. And uh, also growing up, I was always reminded of the million and a half martyrs who died for their faith and knew that I had to honor their memory and pass down the torch to future generations. So that's how I suppose I became an advocate for Christian communities. That's a, a tremendous, tremendous and sobering story. Mario, would you like to take us forward? Well, um, a question. What led you to the birth of Christian in the need, in need foundation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the initial uh, decision was in 2014 with my friend Siobhan Nash Marshall. We saw that the world was in a terrible state. There were all these horrors inflicted against Christians in the Middle East and the Caucasus region. So we got a, a bunch of Christians together. Our board was very interesting, actually. We, we had uh, Apostolic Armenians, Catholics, Melkites, Maronites. I think we had representatives of every uh, church there. So uh, our first project was to arrange for uh, uh, students, Christian students, to come to the USA uh, to study. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we had eight Syrian Christians uh, whose uh, visa applications were all denied. So we turned around and we said, okay, now what do we do? And uh, all of a sudden, we got a phone call from uh, Armenia, from these uh, Catholic nuns in Armenia. And they said, do you have any students to send us to teach our students uh, English? And we realized that that's what God wants us to do. So we reversed our course. We decided to send a volunteer teacher to uh, Christian communities in the Middle East and the Caucasus. So we, uh, Nash had this, uh, I'm sorry, this <laughs> Shaban Nash Marshall had uh, fresh college graduates who were willing to go and uh, live in those communities. So this way, the benefit would be both ways. The community members would benefit uh, from a Western uh, language skills, culture, thinking process, etc. And uh, the volunteer went out there, would uh, develop uh, language skills, uh, I'm sorry, leadership skills. And they would also learn about the community, see the oldest Christian monuments, and churches live amongst the deeply Christian, resilient people. And all of these volunteers who went out there 
uh, they just fell in love with the country. They wanted to go back. And it, it's a very beautiful, uh, predominantly rural landscape. And with a lot of wines, that's where wines originated. <laughs> so, so, and there's a view of Mount Ararat, very poignant, I must say. So that's how we started. You didn't just, mention you didn't mention the mountains. What about the mountains? Yes, the beautiful mountains. I understand that's your special attraction there. <laughs> that's true. I love mountains. <laughs> well, one major figure in the foundation is uh, Antonia Arslan, the, the president. And I've had the opportunity to meet her, but she's a figure of really considerable cultural significance. I, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about her and, and her novels, for example. Sure. Uh, Antonia Arslan is the, the president of CINF currently. And she has a school named after her in Artsakh. We call Nagorno-Karabakh, the region, Armenians call it Artsakh. So Antonia was a professor of modern uh, and contemporary Italian literature. And uh, she has authored many publications uh, focused primarily on her Armenian heritage. The most famous of these books is The Skylark Farm, which was translated into many languages. It was selected as a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. And it also inspired a film. Um, her latest book, in English is The Silent Angel, which is on sale on Amazon. I recommend it. It's based on a true story of uh, two women who, sur uh, who survived the Armenian genocide and vowed to bring a prayer book to safety, even to defend it with their own lives. And uh, this prayer book uh, lies today uh, in a museum uh, called Madenateran in Yerevan, Armenia. So Antonia Arslan is, is really an ambassador of Armenian culture, and she's a one-person army in advocating the Armenian cause in Italy and in Europe in general. A very, a very warm person as well. She is, isn't she? Yes. She's very wise. And, you know, when we have our uh, heated uh, arguments on our board, she's the one to calm us down. She's like the mother army. Uh, kind of. <laughs> you mean you have heated arguments? Sometimes. What when are we you? are passionate about something, it's oh. only natural. Plus, you're human beings. Exactly. <laughs> I just want to put a little sidebar here. You mentioned the difficulty with visas. Uh, a very recent guest of ours, uh, Brother Carmel Duca, has just written a biography of... Uh, Brother Andrew, who was the co-founder with Mother Teresa of the Missionaries of Charity Brothers. And for decades, there has been a struggle over visas. And just recently, the price of religious uh, uh, members of religious orders the price for their securing visas has gone up. It's well over $1,000 now. So that's just one of the little ongoing background struggles that I think most Christians aren't even aware of. 
uh, and I think it's it's worth noting. Of course, what everyone is to some extent aware of is is the political and often military struggle between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I, I wonder, Mario, if you could open up our discussion with Rita to, to that. Well, one other thing that many of our viewers may be asking is that uh, how do we, I don't know if they find, how do we describe what is the background of what we call Armenian culture? What is Armenian culture? Um, to give you a brief background of uh, the whole situation, uh, when uh, Soviets were uh, ruling Armenia, they gave part of Turkey, uh, they, they gave part of Armenia to Turkey and parts of Armenia to Azerbaijan. Um, following the divide and conquer policy. So uh, Armenian culture has begun thousands of years ago. And Artsakh, uh, not what we call uh, Artsakh, is an island oblast in an autonomous province. For uh, decades, deadly battles have raged in that region. And uh, it's a small landlocked region between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, most recently, in uh, September 2020, uh, Azerbaijan unleashed a deadly attack on that province, and since then has been constantly uh, raiding along the borders of Armenia, fighting more and more. Um, Rita, you're, be you're beginning to fade here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, can you hear me better now? Oh, yes, fine. It's fine now. It's just for a moment there. Yeah. So uh, the goal here is uh, President Erdogan of Turkey affirmed is to clean up the entire region of the remains of the sword, as he calls uh, the Armenians and expand access to the Turkish world. Um, only two days ago, President Aliyev described Armenians as uh, cancerous tumors. Now, I don't know which one of this is more insulting, but it, it shows you the kind of the level of hate prevailing in those uh, regions. Uh, the Armenophobia, the Christianophobia. Uh, Armenia is a Christian country surrounded uh, by Islamic nations. The fates of Christians, the uh, fates of uh, you, you, the United States and Armenia are connected. Armenia is the most eastern edge of Western civilization. We have shared values. So there is more than Armenia at stake here. Uh, because with the following of Armenia, uh, I don't think Christians uh, anywhere in the world are immune from civilization. So we have to see the big picture here. And in protecting uh, Armenian culture, Armenian religion, Christianity, not because we are the first Armenian Christian nation, but because the plight of the US and the plight of 
the Armenians are connected. The Americans have major, played a major role in rescuing Armenians in 1915. Near Eastern Relief saved a million orphans. Uh, and thanks to that, the Armenian nation has survived thanks to those efforts. So, um, I forgot what the, your question was. I just got carried on. Well, no. One thing almost immediately leads to another. I have a, a, a sidebar again. I guess I'm notorious for those. In the conflict uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, for the first time, as, as I recall, drones played a, a major role. Uh, and now in, in Ukraine, once again, we're seeing the role of drones. So we, we have hyper-contemporary warfare being tested in, in our task. Yes. But, but Mario, maybe you, you want to pursue your original question. Well, the, my sense without knowing much about the back, background is that Armenia is a nation and as such is nurtured by religious tradition, language, common history. And that nation is wider than the borders, the border that occupied today. And so, and that fact make uh, Armenian culture spill over other countries. And because of that, I think people who don't um, respect other cultures, such as the the war that is being mentioned are attacking Armenians. And at the core of that is the Christianity that is part of the Armenian culture. And that is my point. My point is that, well, what would be the major Characteristic, characteristic of that culture. That's my, my point. I think it's was answered uh, mainly, I think. I don't know this observation or that's my my question. Yes. Um, I think what we also have to remember in this respect is uh, we have to have a moral consistency. You, you cannot support evil from one sector while tolerating it in another. So if we are condemning the Ukraine war, we cannot be seduced by uh, uh, Azeri oil and gas and say, no, that's okay, we the aim is not to hold dictators accountable, but to damage Russia. We need consistency. If we don't deal with smaller conflicts now, they become bigger problems in the future. And, um, and if you can't deal with war crimes, they are repeated on a larger scale in the future. I think... Uh, Adolf Hitler was right in saying when he ordered the Holocaust, he says, who remembers now the Armenian genocide? And uh, so unless we deal with the persecution of Christians in the Middle East, it will, it will become a larger problem. For uh, I don't think Christians anywhere in the world are immune from persecution. I don't think... Uh, Christians in this country are even immune from persecution. I, I read only last month there was uh, an article that the government was keeping tabs on uh, traditionalist uh, 
Catholics, perhaps they are listening to our program today. <laughs> well, one of them is, is on the program, and uh, another, uh, uh, what, what should we say, deep sympathizer is on the program. Right, right. So, um, what we, we speak, have to we speak, do... We speak Latin most of the time. It's, it's just... <laughs> Dan dangerous language. <laughs> Very dangerous, right. So, I mean, we need to unite in solidarity, Christian solidarity. Uh, I mean, I've met some uh, wonderful lawyers at the Thomas More uh, Society yes. and who defend, uh, like, I think we need more resources like that. Um, and uh, unity is strength, as they say. Isolationism just doesn't work. That's true. That's you true. only put yourself in a in a corner with that. Uh, I, I want to ask a, a, a different sort of question. It, uh, su suppose things were to change. And, well, if things change, they have to change with some sort of beginning, point of beginning. If things were to change in Armenia, what might be some of the very first steps? Might it be some sort of treaty? Might it be some sort of an alliance? Might it be some sort of exchange program? Okay. If, if all of a sudden things, gosh, it's looking a little better, there might be some possibilities here. What form might that take? That's true. We have to learn to live with our neighbors. That's, that's a given. Everybody has to get along with their neighbors eventually. And I, I think eventually things will change. I, I pray that they do. Uh, currently, it's very hard because you have uh, dictators on in both Turkey and Azerbaijan as very corrupt dictators who have ruled for the past. Aliyev's clan has been in power for 30 years after the father. Now he took over and he, he made his wife vice president. So um, the people there are also suffering. They need democracy. And we had our not so perfect democracy after the uh, Velvet Revolution. So uh, we are getting there. Um, and eventually these uh, neighbors will also change, I believe. And we have to love our neighbors. And this is a challenging thing to do when you, you have uh, a history of animosity between the two nations. Um, and it's hard when, when your neighbor is unrepentant and acting in the same way. But nevertheless, our faith commands us to love them. So, uh, you know, you have you pray very hard, the starters, and um, you don't stop. You know, I, I don't know. Do they uh, stop being your enemies just because you forgive them? I don't know. Do, do they still hate you? If they still hate you, they they are still your enemies. So. It's it's kind of uh, hard to know if we've uh, gone over it. Uh, we've passed the, that stage of uh, animosity, and we can start afresh. As I mean, we ex we should expect everything because you know Jesus <laughs> said that if they hated me, you know, yeah. they will hate you. They yeah. will persecute you. So. Yeah, and sometimes, but, sometimes we think that if we just make nice, it'll be different. Right, right. But, uh, uh, you know, we also have to be wise as serpents. 
and pure as dust. So this means we have to be prepared, always strong spiritually, culturally. Uh, and so when you... Um, you have to put yourself in the shoes of your enemy. So why, why is it that they act like that? You have to have empathy. You have to turn the tables. And you have to know that they grew up like that, hating, like they start from school. If you see their curriculum, they, uh, they uh, grow up brainwashed and consumed with hate. I mean, can you imagine the terrible state of mind of being consumed with hate all your life that must be quite a burden so i feel sorry for that and so what you have to start with small steps you have to start with finding common ground so i would for example get all the mothers of the killed soldiers together to sit down and share their pain because uh, none of those mothers want uh, this uh, war to continue. And, you know, you know, maybe help them see that we are, uh, they are also victims of autocratic policies of their uh, government. So I would start like that. And then I would start with uh, small programs like the kind of programs we have at our school, uh, we have a lot of vocational courses that, uh, for example, woodworking, and uh, we have uh, tailoring. We, I would get uh, all mothers to come and learn and be involved with each other. And you have to start with st small steps and, uh, you know, it will develop. Do you know, Rita, something along those lines played an important role in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mothers from the Protestant side and mothers from the Catholic side were brought together and had ongoing conversations. And I think that that, that made a difference. Uh, I, I'm also thinking about, uh, and I really like that idea, I'm also thinking about individual acts of, of nonviolent uh, resistance. Uh, now, this isn't the same thing, but one of the things that's going on in Russia is that, uh, as I understand it, tens of thousands of individual Russians are saying, no thanks. We've heard all this state propaganda, but we we just don't believe it. And then I think back to uh, World War II. More and more attention has been given to something called the White Rose Conspiracy, which was basically a group of German students uh, who, who said, "No, we we don't believe what the government is saying." And, and they approached other students and uh, after not so long a period of time at all, they were caught and in short order executed. But the legacy of the White Rose conspiracy in, in Germany is something that I, I think people today treasure. Maybe, maybe you could tell us a bit about how the, the foundation is working with students here in the United States to, to promote and to give workshops, as it were, in, in ethical reasoning, the, the kind of reasoning that will allow them to withstand uh, the kind of forces that, that nationalism is so likely to, to bring against them. Uh, sure, sure. Um, the CINF uh, founded a branch of CINF called the Marshall Institute for Ethical Thought and Action. Uh, this was founded in 2019, and it works with schools, 
educators and students in the New York area to better educate our future leaders. And, uh, you know, it equips them with the skills they need to become knowledgeable and responsible citizens. They hold these uh, ethics bowls, which, which, which is uh, growing in popularity, actually. It's really doing very well. I'm proud of it. Now, with ethical reasoning, uh, disclaimer here, please note that I'm not an educator. Uh, although most of the board members of CINF are. But I, I can give you the common sense approach that I have. So, you know, one can have the knowledge, you, you know, you can have a degree in science, business, medicine, law, and be familiar with the knowledge of base of the profession. But if the person acts in an unethical manner, that undermines the utility of the knowledge. So, uh, for example, uh, us lawyers, we have to have ethical courses, like for every three years, we have to fill up our ethics courses. You look at examples of business failures by CEOs, much of this ethically compromised behavior starts early at school. So schools should not only teach ethical principles, but ethical reasoning, how to use these tools. You have to identify ethical uh, dimensions of a problem. Um, that's what Mario does in Kansas all the time, right? <laughs> Good for you. That's so important. But, I, try, um, I tried to interest him in cryptocurrency, and he said, just forget it. <laughs> yes. So, so dealing with, uh, for example, we, us lawyers, we have to deal with conflict of interest issues always. This is the most common conflict we are faced with. But um, I think ethical reasoning uh, is also useful in uh, family lives and social uh, interactions, everyday life. So... I think it's extremely important. People uh, lack all these basic uh, common sense approaches. Like we've become so uh, politically correct. So we've lost all touch with common sense. Thank you. We certainly need that most uncommon capacity of common sense. Mario, could you take us forward? Well, <clears throat> I was thinking the complex, <clears throat> excuse me, the complexity of ethical reasoning. Just a, just a side comment or a rant. Um, there is a very interesting evaluation of those programs by Christina Hobbs Somers, who um, said a few years back, that all our ethical reasoning program, which is basic introductory course on ethics, are worthless. Because give to students a set of issues, problems, conflict, how to solve them, as if ethics is detached from the human condition, as if it's a problem like a problem in chemistry. And instead, we have forgotten that ethics, the true one, the commonsensical one, is how one become a good person. And that comes from the Christian tradition. Now, if we did divorce that ethics, that uh, approach to ethics from that background, the only thing that we have is just a uh, competing claims 
student learns that like any other, I don't know, um, hard sciences, and then forget about it. And so that is why we have in the West, generally speaking, a collapse of human behavior, human conduct everywhere. And what I'm saying, everywhere is everywhere. So there is just nothing that sustains what we once upon a time was called the West or the Western tradition. Just a side comment. It's a long history. But um, what I'm curious about the foundation is that, that the foundation, as far as I know, initiated uh, different projects in Artsakh, including mm -hmm. a fashion show. Mm -hmm. Could you highlight a little bit about those programs? Sure, sure, Mario. So, um, as I talked before, we started this teaching initiative in Artsakh. And we started off initially with mm -hmm. uh, two uh, American volunteers who lived in uh, in that Armenian Christian uh, community and taught English classes. And then it gradually enrollment increased. It became more popular. And the following year, we sent six uh, volunteers and we taught more courses like teaching English and Italian languages at many different levels, as well as philosophy courses. Um, we actually held an ethics poll there and established an Armenian-American philosophical alliance with a focus on teamwork. So we grew every year. And um, in uh, we there was a waiting list for our courses. And eventually, the government of Artsakh offered us a school. They uh, offered us uh, an educational com uh, complex which uh, was called Antonia Arslan Armenian Italian School. And these schools uh, offered uh, courses, uh, giving them uh, uh, vocations, uh, aiding uh, the local economy, setting them establish industries. So uh, I, uh, actually took with me uh, three uh, Italian uh, master craftsmen uh, who were experts in tailoring and carpentry. And they uh, lived and stayed uh, in uh, Artsakh for three months. And they shared their skills uh, with the students. Uh, and uh, so... The school grew in number. There were like, currently we have 600 students at different levels, starting uh, from kindergarten up all the way, elementary school and all the way up to vocational levels. So as part of the tailoring workshops, the students uh, designed and produced a winter line of clothes with their instructors. So. These clothes were hand manufactured using quality fabrics imported from Italy. And uh, at Christmas of 2021, CINF actually hosted a fashion show uh, which took place in Artsakh, first of its kind of Italian fashion. And all of these uh, clothes were eventually sold on eBay auction. They were sold out. Uh, and we got about $4,000 proceeds to aid the school there. So uh, that's how the uh, fashion show came about. So we hope to, uh, our goal is to develop these programs. If we have peace, of course. That's uh, given. And we want to develop these vocational programs, expand them, and uh, develop 
connections with artisans, uh, businesses, uh, foundations. And uh, of course, we also have the help of Italian uh, educational institutions and uh, non-profits. They are Italian Catholics helping us. So um, they actually uh, helped us find uh, the equipment for these classes. We raised more than a thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars donated woodworking machinery sewing machinery we assisted in the renovation of the school so um oh one italian university also offered an mba program a two-year course to one uh a promising student from arza who is currently studying in uh italy and he's expected to uh, to go back to Artsakh if everything is uh, fine and uh, manage these industries for us. He, he's under contract for us. <laughs> he's getting his education and he's going to go back and manage these industries for us. And the hope is that eventually we will uh, become self-sufficient. Uh, you know, the school will become self-sufficient. We, we will sell our products and uh, uh, develop the school. We're expanding into uh, other courses, if, if everything goes well, you know, cooking classes, uh, cheese making, wine making. So we, we have artisans from Italy ready to go. Thanks to Antonia Arslan's connections, of course, we couldn't have done it without our exceptional board members. And I'm very, very thankful uh, to our board members uh, who have worked so hard. They put their uh, lives at stake uh, sometimes uh, to, they uh, risk their lives in dangerous places around the world and uh, go to Artsakh in these times of war. And uh, for example, one time, Siobhan Nash Marshall, uh, she, she has stood down uh, Russian soldiers in Artsakh. <laughs> and she tells, she tells me, I'm not afraid of Big Brother because I have Big Father. <laughs> and she, <laughs> and uh, you know, one time they wouldn't let her past the border and she took out her cross and she says, listen, here, I'm a Catholic. And, uh, you know, they didn't know what to do with her. They said, okay, go, just go. <laughs> 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 yeah, <clears throat> amazing. We uh, sometimes talk about green shoots and you've described some real signs of growth of green shoots. Uh, often on on our program here, The Open Door, we've talked about the role of beauty and how, how it might be that beauty in this form or that form could save the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a sign of it there in your projects. And we've oftentimes, because we're very much committed to the American Solidarity Party, talked about an alternative to capitalism and an alternative to communism. That is to say, true employee ownership, a true ownership economy that involves cooperatives. And what you're speaking of uh, suggests a, a creative role for cooperatives. So it's, it's just wonderful to hear, hear about those efforts. Well, each, uh, each of our shows, it seems to me, connects with one or other of our prior shows. And, and not so very long ago, and, and this connects with one of uh, Nash Marshall's philosophical interests, we had a show on boredom and what gives rise to boredom. And I can't imagine anyone involved in the 
Christians in Need Foundation having a problem with boredom. <laughs> just, <laughs> just the opposite. Just the opposite. Well, as always, we we close the hour with the reading from the day's gospel. And today it's it's from John. And it's it's rather a, a long gospel. As we get closer and closer to Holy Week, the gospels become uh, more lengthy. But but let me read it as it is. Jesus answered the Jews, "My Father is at work until now, so I am at work." For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, the son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For what he does, the son will also do. For the father loves the son and shows him everything that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you may be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also does the Son give life to whomever he wishes. Nor does the Father judge anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Amen, amen, I, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Amen, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to the Son the possession of life in himself. And he gave him power to exercise judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and will come out, those who have done good deeds to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked deeds to the resurrection of life of condemnation. I cannot do anything on my own. I judge as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much, Rita, for, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope to see you again. And we'll we'll send you the uh, transcript uh, of the link to the show, and you can distribute it. We would be honored to those who are participating in the Christians for Need Foundation. Thank you. God bless. Godspeed. Thank you.